Mr. Pulley back here with you. Africa uh, is our topic this time, world cultures, and looking more information in chapter four, uh, West African kingdoms. Uh, this is sort of a medieval time period in Africa, the same period as the knights and the kings and medieval Europe. Well, this is medieval Africa. And the first sort of uh, kingdom we want to look at, kingdom we want to look at in West Africa is the kingdom of Ghana from 500 to 1076 uh, AD. Uh, this is literally like just right after the fall of Rome, it begins. Uh, it's the first powerful kingdom in West Africa, and it gets its wealth from the gold trade. They're bringing the gold from down in this region in Africa up the rivers to Ghana, and then they control the trade across the Sahara and into Europe. Okay, Our next powerful kingdom is the kingdom of Mali. And Mali runs from about the 1300s to the 1400s. They controlled the gold as well as the salt trays. And at one point in time, salt, believe it or not, is almost as valuable as gold is. Uh, this is actually a kingdom led by uh, Mansa Musa, who we'll talk more about later in another video, uh, a leader who converts to Islam and helps spread Islam into that part of the world. Our final kingdom in this area is the Kingdom of Songhai, which uh, takes over after Mali uh, fails. Uh, Songhai is from 1446 to 1591. They restore the trade after the, the fall of Mali. And again, all these countries control the gold and the salt trades in that region. So the first West African kingdom we want to look at is Benin from the 1400s to the 1800s. Uh, here's Benin City in the 17th century, the 1600s. They controlled the trade at the mouth of the Niger River, supplying Europeans at that time with everything from slaves to gold. Okay. Uh, so getting rid of uh, Benin, our, our next kingdom we want to look at is the Great Zimbabwe from the 1300s to the 1400s. They controlled gold mines in uh, southern parts of Africa uh, that then eventually got that gold to Europe. Great Zimbabwe, uh, a magnificent city that uh, the ruins of which still exist, much like a medieval fortress kind of city uh, in Europe at that time period. And finally, we want to look at some of the kingdoms in East Africa, city-states from the 1300s to the 1500s that uh, traded with Egypt, India, even uh, up into uh, Europe. Uh, you've got Ethiopia, Axum, here's Kush again. Uh, Zimbabwe is actually down here in Mono Moldapa, as they're saying here. Uh, the Zulu kingdoms in very southern Africa. And in three, two, one, patterns of life in Africa. I'm going to look at family life and a little bit at the roles of women here very quickly. Um, family life, we're talking about um, nomadic uh, hunting and gathering societies, small groups. Again, remember we end up with, because of the geography and the harshness of the train and difficulty traveling, we end up literally with thousands of language groups that develop in Africa. Uh, those folks who do settle down and farm uh, rely on an extended family, grandparents, parents, children, and they are subsistence farmers. Subsistence farmers are growing just enough food to be able to feed themselves, their family, with a small, small amount left over to trade to get some other things that they can't produce themselves. Okay. There are very important links to other families. This is done through our lineage. Think our ancestors are going back, our family tree, so to speak. Uh, these things are very important because these links help form clans. And if you will, think clans, think tribes for us in terms of our culture. Think not just grandparents, parents, kids, but also aunts, uncles, cousins, those types of relatives as well. Now, the role of women traditionally in uh, African society is patriarchal, where men are in control and few rights for the women. Uh, but we do see some matriarchal societies, uh, primarily the Ashanti and the Wolof, uh, and in these cases, uh, matriarchal societies, women have rights not just uh, to help influence government, but sometimes can even be in control. And in matriarchal societies, literally, uh, you trace your family lineage back, not through your, parent, your father, but through your mother. Okay. However, again, most are patriarchal societies, and uh, women have very, very few rights, and men are firmly in charge. There's a problem in some societies where there's this concept of having to pay for your bride. And the problem with that is that men have to work a long time to earn the money. And as a result, they're older when they have the money to afford to get married, and they're marrying these much younger brides. This is caused by this tribute called bride wealth paid to the 
family of the bride. Okay, patterns of life. Let's look quickly at government and uh, education. This learning together, governmental uh, conditions. We have some areas under the control of a powerful ruler. Think a chief or a king, if you will. Uh, and that's sort of that um, uh, situation we've seen in lots of other cultures. Uh, some areas are led by uh, discussions where people get together almost as a council or usually a council of elders, and they rule by consensus. They reach uh, a compromise and rule that way. Okay. Now, sometimes small villages with a ruler might be part of a larger kingdom. And that's that idea of a kingdom that takes over, might uh, rule over them, but by allowing them local control, it's easier to get them to uh, not be fighting back against us. Okay. In terms of education, boys and girls are grouped together with others born in the same year. This is called the age grade system, and students always ask me, age grade, that just seems kind of weird. Hey, you guys are all grouped because you're born in the same year. You're freshmen. Okay, it's the same kind of idea. Difference is, kind of like in England, boys are educated separately from the girls. Okay, younger groups here are often taught the values of society, their beliefs, their cultural values of society and the culture by the older groups. So think of it this way: imagine the seniors were teaching you guys, the freshmen. African religions, traditional religions in Africa had this idea of a supreme being with a number of lesser gods. Uh, there's a sense of ancestor worship where ancestor souls are reborn into children. And if you didn't worship your ancestor correctly, well, these guys can help you or hurt, harm you. Okay, the idea is if you treat them nicely and honor their, your ancestors, they help you out in this world. Uh, if not, uh, woe be to you. Uh, they also believe in a living spirit in every object. This is similar to Native American beliefs of a, a great spirit and belonging in every uh, living thing in, in the world. Okay. And we also have a sense of diviners or priests, as you will, in, in our culture. Uh, think a, a, a tribal diviner, someone who might tell us about the future. And also then this healer, sort of our type of doctor, is a traditional type of doctor. Okay. Christianity and Judaism, uh, more traditional languages that we know, or religions, excuse me, that we know about, um, are stronger in Eastern Africa. Think of those areas of Axiom and Kush we looked at earlier, uh, today, modern day Ethiopia. In fact, Ethiopia, when later European missionaries get there, find that these guys have been Christians uh, longer than the countries that they came from as missionaries. Um, strong Christianity in Ethiopia remains to this very day. Okay. Islam, of course, uh, one of the largest religions in Africa, uh, starting in the Arabian Peninsula and spreading north across Africa into the west. And we'll talk a little bit about that more with uh, Mansa Musa. First, before that, we'll talk a little bit about the slave trade. Okay. Slavery, guys, it's been around as long as humans have kind of been around. If there's a civilization, unfortunately, there's a slavery involved. Um, the scale in the slave trade that begins with the New World starts around this time with the Arab slave trade. Uh, the Trans-Sahara slave trade is taking slaves from parts of Africa to the Middle East uh, in the 7th and 8th centuries. That's the 600s and 700s as Muslim Arabs conquered parts of North Africa in the spread of Islam. Uh, the trade grows from the 10th to the 15th century, from the 900s into the 1400s, and peaks in the mid-1900s. Uh, in this latter part of time, they're feeding in demand by Europeans for slaves in the New World. Okay. Now, European explorers uh, had reached uh, North Africa by the 1400s, starting first with the Portuguese. Uh, there's no real demand for slaves in Europe. However, with plantations in Africa by the Portuguese and in the Americas, demand for slaves skyrockets would need someone to work the land. The demand for slavery in the New World is so great it literally destroys many of the cultures in Western Africa, but its influence is in all parts of Africa. Okay, We traditionally think of slaves coming from uh, these areas of Western Africa being brought to uh, Brazil, uh, Venezuela, Colombia, the islands in, in the Caribbean, and North America as well. But they often came uh, just as well from Eastern Africa, although uh, some of those were going the opposite direction to the East Indies. Now, slavery, in terms of bringing them to the New World, the Europeans are packing these guys very tightly on these ships. 
uh, crowded, unsanitary conditions on the slave ships. Cargo packed so tightly it's almost impossible to move. There's literally two schools of thought. One is a tight pack, get as many as you can. Hey, they're going to die. Throw them overboard. No big deal. We can still get there with more alive. Get them a little healthy before you trade them off and then sell them that way. The other idea is start with fewer, take better care of them on the trip, uh, and can turn them around much quicker. Uh, unfortunately, tight pack wins out over loose pack. Um, the dead ones, there's literally tales of sharks following the ships all the way from Africa to the New World. It's a lucrative business for more than 200 years, such as the demand for the plantations in the New World for feed European appetites and demand for uh, cash crops. And literally 10 million, as your book says, Africans forcibly transported to the New World. I've seen figures as high as 14, 15 million. Really a sad chapter in world history. I told you I was going to come to that story of Mansa Musa, and we did tell that a little bit in class. He's that ruler of Mali who made a pilgrimage to Mecca in 1424. He's a devout Muslim. Pilgrimage to Mecca, the fifth pillar of Islam, shown here holding a nugget of gold in a Catalan atlas. Catalan is a region of Spain. However, this book was made in Spain for Charles V of France in 1413. Okay. Mansa Musa on pilgrimage, it's impressive. Thousands come with him, including 500 slaves. That's 500 slaves, okay? Each with a golden staff, each with nice clothing, each some of which with clothing that had gold thread ornately woven through it as decorative details. Better dressed than some kings in Europe, okay? He brought with him 100 camels, each with 300 pounds of gold, Remember the price of gold from the day? If not, look it up again. By the way, there's 16 ounces in a pound of gold. There's 300 pounds. You do the math. Gave away so much, the price of gold drops for a dozen years in the Middle East. Uh, but his adoption of Islam uh, increased Islamic influence in Africa as he spreads it not just in Western Africa, but around Africa as well. Timbuktu, his uh, capital in Mali, turns from just being a trading center to a cultural center, a knowledge center uh, of Western Africa and one of the most important places in Western Africa. Okay, stopping there, going to look at European imperialism uh, in a follow-up video, which will finish uh, chapters three and four. So you should probably at this point be about close to two-thirds of the way, three-fourths of the way through your study guide. If not, go back and watch them again. See you soon.